podcast, and so they're waiting to start the recording until exactly 12.15. Okay, we're good. Okay. Hi, welcome to Syria Domestic International and Humanitarian Legal Aspects of a U.S. Military Strike. Um, thank you for coming. I'm really glad everyone came today. I'm Rachel Mueller. I'm president of National Security Law Society. I have a quick announcement about our society before Danny starts and gives you um, a history of the conflict and then introduces our panelists really quickly. We have a few positions that are open. We've gotten lots of good applications, but if anyone is still interested in applying, um, we would ask that you submit the applications, I'm sorry, not by 5 p.m. today, but by 6 p.m. on Friday. So if anyone is interested in applying for a position, especially as a 1L, if you're looking for leadership experience, um, you can be a 1L rep or if you would like a specific kind of duty, those are the other positions that are open. Um, just send a paragraph explaining why you're interested and a little bit about yourself to me at my email address, rachel.mueller. There's an E in there, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, at duke.edu. Um, that's it. I'll turn it over to Danny. Thank you all for coming. Okay, so I'm just going to do a really brief, uh, talking very fast introduction to the conflict in Syria, uh, starting with the history of Syria. So who have map? Um, there's a lot of tensions to understand that are at play in the conflict, and this is basically... Uh, the current demographics, religious demographics, is about 74% Sunni Muslim, 16% uh, others, uh, Shia mostly, and a subset of that, Alawites. And that comes into play later. Um, going really back far in history, a lot of this conflict stems from um, the origins of after uh, the Prophet Muhammad died in uh, 632, um, whether, uh, how the secession would be uh, handled. Um, so that tension still lives up today. Um, and currently about 80% uh, of Muslims worldwide are Sunni, but that's the opposite in Syria. Uh, obviously, Sunnis kind of won out in the debate, um, and there was a battle of Karbala in uh, 680 where uh, Ali's son was, was killed, and that kind of really uh, cemented the divide between the two sects. Uh, skipping forward a lot to World War I, Syria was part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, uh, which sided with Germany, but there was an, a Muslim revolt, an Arab revolt, uh, to essentially establish a Syrian state. Um, this was supported by French and British forces, both financially and uh, with weapons. Um, and this allowed British to uh, launch attacks through the Suez Canal without uh, fear of, of more attacks. Um, in return, uh, they were promised a Syrian state. But unbeknownst to them, the French and British had their own agreement, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which divided Syria into French and British, British control. Uh, pretty much French took over most of it and um, kind of divided and ruled. Uh, the divides created strong sectarian tensions and the French kind of exploited these tensions to maintain control. They recruited the Alawites and the Alawites, if you remember, are one of the minority groups. This is a group that has been historically very oppressed and this was one of their first chance to have sort of upward social mobility so it explains why they were uh, eager to take these positions. Um, this leads on to uh, just after World War II, there was a new Alawite leader, and that is Hafez al-Assad. That's the, pre the father of the current Syrian president. Uh, he was a former Syrian minister of defense, and in 1967 uh, was embarrassed by Israeli attacks and um, seized power in 1970 through a military coup. Became known as the Arab strongman uh, because of uh, some initial success uh, in the battle in the Golan Heights against Israel um, in 1973. His regime is considered uh, oppressive, secular, um, but it's to some extent it brought stability to the regime and some protection for the minority groups. Um, he also had very strong allies with Iran and Russia, and Russia is actually where he tra uh, trained for his military training. He died in 2000, his son took over, Bashar al-Assad, the current president of Syria. Uh, initially there was a lot of hopes for political reform, but those hopes were dashed as uh, some commentators say they thought he would um, reform the, um, the regime, but the regime sort of reformed him. Um, he started some economic reforms. These were uh, widely unpopular because it, it was viewed as a few people gained a lot and a lot of people were uh, still in poverty. At the same time, coming into 2010, you have drought, unemployment, and Arab Spring uh, throughout the Middle East. Uh, in various ways, as you all are aware, he's sought to crush the opposition uh, very violently and has been accused of using chemical weapons. Um, this leads today was basically a proxy war between the Syrian regime um, and Syrian rebels with uh, the 
the Sunni and the Shiite Arab worlds uh, against each other. You have uh, the U.S. kind of supporting aspects of the Syrian rebels kind of to weaken Iranian influence in the region and also protect uh, Israel. And you have Russia and Iran uh, lining up with um, the Syrian regime. So that is a very brief introduction to where we are today. So I'd like to introduce our panel members. Uh, starting out, we're going to have General Dunlap and then uh, Professor Helfer and Professor Bradley, and they will talk about the legal aspects of the uh, current situation. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to General Dunlap. Thank you very much, Nanny. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, very briefly give you sort of my own uh, little bit of a review uh, and a little bit of the military aspects. And Danny did a wonderful job of, of laying it out. I think some of the things might be debatable among some people, but that's, that's the whole purpose. Uh, just to review very quickly how we got to where we are, you might remember there was a lot of publicity about the alleged use of chemical weapons. At that time, it was alleged, reported in the world press. There was some other analysis done. This is a Human Rights Watch analysis that was done pointing to the source of the rockets that were used to distribute chemical weapons coming from uh, Syrian military compounds. It's not very hard to do. The methodology uses standard weapons, in other words, weapons used for conventional uh, operations, mortars and so forth, are just you know, fitted with a munition involving chemical weapons. There was a lot of, after the president announced his intention to use force, uh, there was a lot of public skepticism. We could almost have a whole panel on just why that is, why the American people were not uh, willing to use force even when the president assured that there would be no troops on the ground. I think there's a lot, lot to, and we may get to that in the Q&A. Uh, more of that, and I think uh, more of the background is going to come from Professor Helfer and his analysis of the international law, but I think also uh, Professor Bradley is going to give us a little bit of analysis on the president's authority to use force in this situation. Because it is controversial on the international level for sure. The UN uh, made the, uh, the Secretary General made the, the classic argument that the use of force under in the post-charter era is only authorized by the Security Council or in an instance of self-defense. One of the best analysis of all this that I've personally seen is a friend of mine, Mike Schmidt, up at the Naval War College, came out with a law review article on the subject on the 3rd of September, and how he does this. <laughs> he always does stuff like this, and it annoys me no end. Um, and he basically came to the conclusion that the proposal that the U the analysis that the UK did, and you might remember before the UK Parliament voted against working with the United States on a use of force operation. They concluded that uh, humanitarian intervention would be the only possible legal basis. And in this article, Professor Schmidt goes, <clears throat> goes through a lot of the different theories, and he comes up with humanitarian intervention being the only possible one, but he clearly points out the defects of that theory as something to be relied on in the international realm. And of course, remember, international law is one thing, domestic law is something else. Uh, and of course, today we have uh, the discussion, uh, reporting of President Obama's speech at the UN, and where he makes it clear that while he prefers a diplomatic solution, he still remains, I think, prepared to use force if necessary to get compliance. And just about an hour ago, uh, there was a report out that the UN inspectors are reporting, uh, going back to Syria to do some more investigation. Exactly what they're doing isn't, isn't clear right now. A little bit of background on this. There's a good one-page article in a magazine called This Week, which lays out kind of a Q&A, give you the big picture. There's a couple things that I wanted to point out to you. The use of chemical and even poisonous weapons is not particularly new in the history in the history of warfare. 
because uh, as you can see from this, this part of the article, it's been used for thousands of years in different ways. Uh, but really, when you think about it, why did people particularly get upset about chemical weapons? Because after all, we have plenty of weapons in the inventory that are even more horrific, I would suggest, than chemical weapons. Uh, as I've talked to my class, we've talked about thermobaric weapons, which uh, they're fuel air explosives. You use them against caves and so forth, where it literally uh, puts fuel in the air and then it ignites it and it creates such a suction because it's burning all the oxygen, it'll literally pull your lung out. And uh, this was developed in response to the Ottawa Convention because we used to use anti-personnel landmines to try to uh, stop the threat posed by deeply buried targets and, and uh, especially caves. But I think that this article makes an important point, and we see this in, in other areas, that sometimes there is certain things about human nature that causes a revulsion. And this article suggests that in, deeply embedded in the human psychology is a fear of things that are poisonous. And that may be a very primal sort of thing that is touched on when you start talking about chemical weapons. I'd also su suggest to you that I think this is part of the revulsion among many people about the use of drones because it seems impersonal and so forth. So there's a lot of psychology at play. Uh, there's been a long uh, history of trying to regulate and eliminate poisonous weapons. Uh, and as you know, the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention in 1993 has gotten very wide acceptance with a few notable exceptions. In this case, Syria is not a party to it. But people will tell you that there is a, a, a prohibition in customary international law subject to being uh, corrected by my betters about the use of chemical weapons even in non-international armed conflicts. There are lots of chemical weapons still around in the world. The U.S. has them. They're not operationalized. We're, the U.S. is in the process of trying to destroy them, which is something we might want to keep in mind. It's very hard to destroy a chemical weapon. It's very dangerous to destroy a chemical weapon. In fact, most of U.S. chemical weapons have been transported to a remote island in the Pacific, Johnston Atoll, where hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to build a factory, in essence, to destroy chemical weapons. And uh, that has since closed down, and there's still two places in the U.S. where chemical weapons are in the process of being destroyed. But as we look ahead, there, I've seen some est estimates that it will be billions of dollars to try to destroy the Syrian uh, stocks of chemical weapons and thousands of people involved in doing that. So it's a complicated process. Striking Syria, there's been a lot of speculation in the press as to how and when and, and what would, would be. As you can see, the lay down here, there's a, a number of uh, areas where weapons are supposedly stored as well as Syrian military installations. Uh, the distances really aren't that great. Uh, that, that, is, that is not a long distance relative to uh, for a, a military strike. And even if it's not, even if we're not able to use the UK bases, there's the uh, Tomahawk land attack missile can be fired from ships. It can be it can be fired from uh, from submarines, and it is a uh, interesting weapon in that it um, it's good against softer targets. It's not so good against harder targets. And as you might imagine, chemical weapons are kept in what we call igloos in part to prevent them from being destroyed, but also in case something goes wrong with the storage of the weapons. I don't know if we have time to, do we have time to do a one minute video? That's just so you can see a little bit of, about how this. About the same works. time, the Navy introduced its Tomahawk land attack missile. A T-LAM can carry one of four distinctly different warheads. An anti-ship warhead for use against ocean going targets.
1,000 pound explosive warhead to send against targets inland. The advantage the of this weapon is dispenses submunitions, small bomblets against airfields and other softer structures. What those bombers spew out is like all bearings. Is so the forth. nuclear land attack missile. All of the nuclear land attack tomahawks have now been taken out of service. The brain that makes the tomahawk smart is the guidance system. The land attack tomahawks have a system called TURCOM, terrain contour matching. As it enters the land, it starts picking up contours of the ground, which were previously surveyed by satellite, digitized, and put into a computer. As the missile flies over the land, its radar looks down, compares the terrain with what's on its digitized tape. When they match, it knows it's going the right direction. If it doesn't match, it then looks for the exact path it should be taking and it follows this to its target. It then uses another guidance system which cuts in and guides it to within literally a few feet of the aim point. You know, I think with, with any weapon system, things go wrong. And you might notice how slow that thing flies. It flies slower than a judge, so it can be shot down. And and it, or it can be made to go awry. So we always have to think about that. There's other ways of attacking the targets without putting troops on the ground or even overflying the target. There are air-delivered missile systems, but the range is much shorter than the TLAM. There's been uh, a lot of work in the Department of Defense on trying to figure out how to attack these targets because obviously part of the problem is that you don't want to be blowing a lot of stuff up into the atmosphere. So a lot of money has been sent, spent in the Air Force to tr try to develop weapons that will incinerate the target. And this system is kind of interesting because it doesn't use explosives. It uses kinetic energy. And when these rods go down, they generate so much heat when they hit the target that they can incinerate the target. But that requires overflying Syria. And that, anytime you overfly an in a hostile area, there's always the danger that somebody might end up being captured. There's been a lot of stuff in the press about what the targets would be. Uh, it may well be that, no, that people would not try to actually strike the, the chemical weapons themselves, but maybe the delivery systems or other things that the Syrians value so that they know that they're at risk of losing more capability. And there's lots of, lots of potential targets, and you see how close they are to the coast. So that raises, um, it's, very, it's harder for the Syrians to defend because although the missiles may fly not at supersonic speed or as fast as, as some other delivery systems might, they will have not that much time, especially from a submarine-launched missile, to try to do anything about it. Can strikes work? There's a lot of, in the press that says that they can't work. But I would suggest to you that they sometimes can. I was involved in an operation in the late 90s where it was Operation Desert Fox. It was three days of strikes against Iraqi uh, weapons of mass destruction facilities because uh, Saddam Hussein wasn't complying with the UN directives at that time. It, and I can tell you, everybody involved in that operation thought that, yeah, we blew up some stuff, but it's not really going to stop Saddam Hussein. But in Tom Ricks's book, Fiasco, which is about the Iraq war, uh, he quoted David Kay, who was a UN weapons inspector, and after he went back to Iraq, he found that, indeed, after those attacks, the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction uh, program, and particularly the nuclear program, really did wither away and never gained momentum again. And a lot was because of the psychological effects. So sometimes the use of force is not so much aimed at destroying all the 
potentially threatening, but it can create a psychological dimension in the, uh, in the mind of your target area. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor Helfer, and um, he'll, he's going to give you a think, the international law perspective, and then we're yep. going to hear from Professor so thanks, Bradley on the domestic. Thank, thanks, uh, Danny, for and the societies for organizing, and to Charlie for giving us a great introduction. Um, I didn't know you were that adept with technology. I'm extremely <laughs> impressed. Um, I did that this morning, too. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Um, I'm going to focus on three issues that I think are kind of at the heart of understanding the international law questions involving the potential for a U.S. strike against Syria. I'm, uh, first, I'm going to give a very brief thumbnail sketch of the UN Charter Collective Security System and how it relates to the unilateral use of force. Uh, I'm going to end up coming out, I would say, pretty much in the same place as uh, Mike Schmidt did, but I'll kind of explain how I got there. Um, and then I want to actually talk about how this system, as it was designed, how did it function in practice, or not function in practice, as the case may be, up until the current crisis. And there has been a big change over the last few years, this idea of humanitarian intervention and the so-called responsibility to protect, or R2P, a rapidly evolving international norm uh, that uh, has come up with surprising speed. And the question is, how does that interact with the existing collective security system if it's not functioning? And finally, I'll say a few words about the recent bilateral agreement between the US and Russia, which requires a serious disclosure uh, of its chemical weapons and inspections. So that's the basic structure. There's many more things we could talk about, but, but that's what I'll, I'll try to hit. And then if you have other questions, I'll, I'll try to answer them in Q&A. So I think it's fairly obvious, but it's worth stating that the UN Charter is, you have to think about its historical context. So it arises at the end of World War II. It arises with the victors of World War II essentially saying, we need to establish some kind of collective security system, because the one we tried between the wars obviously didn't work. Uh, that was the League of Nations. And so the thought was, well, we've got to in some way blend politics and law in order to create a functional system that will replace the unilateral uses of force, with some exceptions, very small exceptions, with a collective security system. So that's a grand idea. Uh, and I would say it's the hardest, in some ways, question in international law to think about uh, how you regulate uh, use ad bellum questions. And it's a really tough one because politics and law are very close together as well as, as military issues. So a couple of key provisions of the charter uh, that, are, that are worth noting. So Article 2.4 talks about, uh, creates a general prohibition on the uh, use or threats of force by one UN member state against the uh, territorial integrity or political independence of another state. So that's a general prohibition. But that prohibition is overridden by Chapter 7 of the Charter, which allows the UN Security Council to respond to threats to and breaches of international peace and security uh, by adopting resolutions that range all the way from condemnation to the magic language, all necessary means, which is essentially uh, a green light to use force. Uh, and in order to get such a resolution, you need a, major a super majority of nine of the 15 council members, plus at least the acquiescence, that is no veto of one of the permanent five members, so Russia, US, France, UK, and China. Um, so what if you don't have that? What if there is no Security Council resolution authorizing force? Well, uh, the UN Charter is not a suicide pact, so the individual member states retain their inherent right to individual self-defense in the face of an armed attack or an imminent threat of such an attack. They also retain their right to have collective self-defense. So one state can be able to um, respond, but it might be much more effective if a group does. So hence, security pacts like NATO are permitted uh, under the UN Charter, provided that um, they're used in the appropriate context, which is when there's an actual use or threatened, I mean, imminent threatened use of force. Another ground for the use of force, consent. So I see no, some of my students are here, so we've seen situations where one state can consent to the use of force uh, in the territory uh, uh, of another. And there is also likely a narrow humanitarian rescue exception when, say, the nationals of State A are held hostage or threatened with death or bodily harm in State B, State A might be able to uh, have a kind of very limited intervention in order to rescue its own nationals. Uh, 
the last two of those uh, provisions come up through state practice. The first two are very clear in the text of Article 51 of the Charter. But notice what's omitted. What's omitted is uh, the, in the absence of a UN Security Council resolution, states can't use force as a reprisal, that is in response to another country's violation of a treaty or customary international law. Um, so if there is a breach, even of a fundamental norm, and even if we say that the use of chemical weapons against civilians is use kogans or a peremptory norm, that doesn't um, authorize as a response the use of military force in the absence of a Security Council authorization. Second, so what's not included in the existing uh, collective security system, uh, uses of military force to prevent humanitarian crises. So obviously to the extent that the UN Charter is set up uh, kind of with a default preference, it's a preference against intervention because of the way the voting structure of the UN Security Council works. So how has it functioned in practice? Is this structure kind of the Achilles heel of the United Nations or is it kind of the logic and the design feature of how it was actually supposed to work. Um, just a few words about kind of uh, the history of humanitarian intervention leading up to the Syrian crisis to put that in context with a focus on the emergence, as I said before, of this R2P principle. So most of the Cold War between 1945 when the UN's created up until the end of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, you essentially have blocks uh, against intervention that are contrary to the interests of either of the two great powers, the US or the USSR. So there really wasn't much in the way of, of intervention. The big change comes in the first Gulf War in 1991. It's a paradigmatic example of big aggressor state uh, overrunning and challenging uh, smaller, weaker state, and the, and the UN charter system functions exactly as it was intended to, uh, where you get uh, a, a resolution building up to the authorization of the use of force, and then the authorization, and then ultimately the successful uh, pushing back of Saddam Hussein's forces into Iraq from Kuwait. Uh, so that was a big a groundbreaking change. And the thought was, well, what will this do for humanitarian intervention? That was not really a humanitarian intervention. But throughout the 1990s, there were a number of different Security Council authorizations uh, of peacekeeping operations, interventions of various types uh, in response to humanitarian crises in, for example, Haiti, Somalia, the former Yugoslavia, follow-ups to the war in Iraq. Um, and, and this seemed to suggest that the system was now finally functioning as one uh, would have hoped it would function. That is, when there was a humanitarian crisis, the Security Council would act. Uh, it could delegate the, the use of force to the member states, and there would be a response. Um, the first kind of monkey wrench in that uh, kind of uh, approach was uh, the Kosovo situation, the bombing of Kosovo. Uh, this is that the final stages of the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. At that point, Slovodan Milosevic is president of Serbia. Kosovo tries to break away, uh, predominantly made up of uh, Albanian uh, Muslims, uh, ethnic Muslims, uh, for ethnic Albanians who are Muslims, sorry. Uh, and the UN Security Council uh, is considering what, how, what to do in response to the possibility that Serbian forces are really going to uh, invade that part of the province and that there would be widespread civilian casualties. So um, at that point, uh, Russia, which was an ally of Serbia, says, no, we're not going to authorize force. And NATO says, well, this is really a crisis. And in these unique circumstances, uh, we're, going, we're going to use force anyway. And the bombing campaign was, uh, went ahead. It was successful. It stopped the atrocities from occurring. But was it a violation of international law? So there was a lot of hand-wringing after the Kosovo bombing. What's actually happening to international law? So for those of you who uh, have studied it, you know that international law evolves through state practice and interpretations of what states intend vis-a-vis -vis state practice. So there was an outpouring of, of discussion about these issues. Um, what, how do we characterize the Kosovo uh, precedent? And I think the weight of opinion was uh, that this bombing was illegal but legitimate. That's a very strange phrase. What does it mean? Well, it was illegal because it didn't have prior authorization from the Security Council, but it was legitimate or justified because all diplomatic uh, avenues had been exhausted, and the bombing had uh, uh, the direct effect of liberating the majority population of Kosovo from what would have been uh, 
uh, oppression under Serbian rule. So the thought was, okay, well, this is a possibility. How do we contain this? Because obviously humanitarian intervention can be used as a pretext. It can be misused or abused. And so uh, a number of commentators, most notably a panel of experts known as the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, uh, came together and tried to flip this idea of whether there should be or was a right to intervene on its head and said, in fact, each state uh, in the world has a responsibility to protect its own citizens against uh, uh, widespread human rights violations. So that was the framing of this idea of R2P. It caught on, it was, was done really kind of right at maybe 10 years ago or so, caught on like wildfire with governments, with commentators, with the General Assembly. Uh, but the first real test uh, of it came in 2001 in Libya. Uh, when in the Arab Spring, which is also what leads to the violence and the unrest in Syria. 2011. 2011, what did I say? 2001. 2001, 2011, pardon me, 2011. Thank you, Kurt. Um, uh, the Gaddafi regime threatening mass violence against uh, the rebels in the Benghazi region of Libya, uh, and faced with this imminent, uh, credible threat of civilian deaths in the tens of thousands, the Security Council does, in fact, authorize the use of force, does, for the first time, refer to the R2P principle, uh, and says that uh, there can be force used to protect uh, civilians and enforce a no-fly zone over the country. But the resolution, this isn't widely, maybe widely known, it's passed by the barest majority. So it's a 10 to 0 with five abstentions, and the five include uh, two uh, P5 members, uh, China and Russia, but also Brazil, Germany, and India. So you have just barely enough political support for the authorization. And what happens, however, is that as the NATO uh, begins its airstrikes, uh, and it, it does in fact end up protecting civilians, but it also tips the balance in favor of the rebels uh, who were uh, uh, rebelling against uh, Gaddafi and leads to regime change. And Russia is really furious about this because there are allegations that NATO had exceeded the mandate the Security Council had given it, that this was an experiment that, you know, had failed, and that the, the idea of this happening again was going to be anathema from Russia's perspective and, and also, although to a lesser degree expressed, from China's perspective too. Uh, and that is in fact what has happened. There have been attempts for the last two years to have a variety of Security Council resolutions forget about authorizing force, even milder resolutions condemning civilian attacks by the Assad regime. The Russia has actually exercised and threatened its veto, and it has blocked these resolutions from, from going forward. Okay, so what, what would have happened, right? So now it looks like the threat of uh, force is uh, receding, and um, I think that's obviously a good thing, but would it have been lawful if the United States had bombed Syria unilaterally without a Security Council resolution? And I think the, the, by far the weight of the commentary, and I would align myself with this, would be no. It's no doubt that the use of chemical weapons um, is uh, an egregious violation of international law. The specific details of that are something we could discuss because Syria is not a member, as Charlie pointed out, of the Chemical Weapons Convention. But let's even assume it's a violation of, of the most fundamental use Kogan's norms of, of international law. That doesn't justify a violation of another use Kogan's norm. Uh, now, that said, how then do you deal with what might be seen as a flaw in the system? And interestingly, and Professor Dunlap mentioned the, the UK uh, Foreign Office paper, they released a very short document that said, look, we think we can uh, go ahead and bomb consistently with international law. Relying on the Kosovo precedent, relying on some other precedents, we think that um, in the face of an overwhelming uh, threatened humanitarian catastrophe uh, or the, the, the need to disrupt the future use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime, we can lawfully intervene unilaterally uh, if three conditions are met. So there's got to be convincing evidence of extreme humanitarian distress that requires some kind of urgent response. Uh, it must be clear that all other measures, all other practical alternatives have been tried uh, and won't work or have proven not to work if lives are going to be saved. And the force that's used has to be necessary and proportionate. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically it. And the UK says at the time it issues this document that all three conditions would clearly be met in response to the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. 
Um, now, what is the UK doing here? It is attempting to remake international law by effectively breaking it, by saying international law has changed. They sort of allied that distinction um, as to whether they're actually violating it. But I think the, the weight of authority is they're attempting to create an, a new rule. And the way states sometimes can do that is by asserting that the old rule is no longer valid, even in the face of claims by other states, and Putin uh, has certainly made that, that indeed it would be a violation of international law. The problem with these sorts of tests, I understand why the UK wanted to have these three components, but um, that the claim that they were met seems to have been pretty quickly undermined by the fact that the US and Russia actually do then uh, begin to negotiate, come up with a bilateral deal for Assad to disarm. So you have to be careful, especially as things have evolved so quickly as government lawyers and, and officials, uh, foreign affairs ministers in the heat of the moment, making predictions about what is, uh, what is clearly met by the evidence and what is not. Um, so what results is this agreement, uh, and I'll just say two words about that and then turns over, turn things over to Professor Bradley, an agreement between the US and Russia, which obligates Syria to uh, respond in a particular way. That's a little weird, right? So when, how can the US and Russia bind Syria? Well, formally they can't, and those of you who have taken my class know I always talk about the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. It makes clear that a treaty cannot create rights or obligations for a third state without its consent. But Syria has consented by saying that it will, it has disclosed a list of uh, its <coughs> stockpiles, and it has agreed to join the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, so how is this agreement going to be enforced? Well, if you use the structure of the enforcement provisions of the Chemical Weapons Convention, it's very, quite detailed. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the mechanisms include verification, information disclosure, naming and shaming, loss of rights and privileges, at most economic sanctions. Uses of force, again, are to be, those questions are to be referred to the UN Security Council. So essentially, we are back to that body and right now, the attempt is to negotiate a resolution. The bilateral agreement does say it's to be under Chapter 7 of the Charter, so that is the provision that authorizes force, although it doesn't require it. There are other measures that could be used. And so the question is, what will the Security Council now do? Um, and will there be a one resolution that, if it's violated, authorizes the use of force? Or will there be, as I think is more likely, uh, a, re a, a resolution that says, we'll have to reconvene to consider that at a later date. I'll stop here and turn things over to Professor Bradley. Oh, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna shift to some of the US law issues uh, that might be associated with the decision if one were made to use force in Syria. Um, at the moment, it looks like that's not going to happen, although it's certainly possible that would change back again, particularly if Syria looks like it's being uncooperative on the chemical weapons program. Um, if Congress approves the use of force in Syria, say as it did in Iraq, a lot of Democrats would like to forget that the Congress actually approved the use of force in 2000, uh, late 2002 in Iraq, uh, that would mean that it would be legitimate under U.S. law. That is, if Congress authorizes war making, everybody agrees that it, under U.S. law it's legally legitimate, even if it violates all of the international law that <coughs> Professor Helford just described. That is, under U.S. law, Congress is allowed to violate international law. And, uh, and we just deem that legitimate, even though obviously the international community would not accept that and they, and they would think we're in violation. So the central question in the US law is really whether the president needs to go to Congress. Uh, because if he does and he's successful, that really resolves the US law question. But does he need to go there at all? Can the president just order uh, the ships to shoot Tomahawk missiles and other things without going to Congress, which can be difficult to do? And there are a lot of legal issues associated with that. Uh, until, and through almost the end of August, President Obama stated publicly that he intended to use force and did not intend to go to Congress, so that he had made up his decision. And that was even true after the British, who said they were going to support the use of force, went to their own Congress, their parliament, and did not get authorization, and then backed down. Um, and, and Obama said he was going to do it on his own. And then at the last minute, at the end of August, as you may recall, he changed his mind and decided to go to Congress after all. He stated, uh, having made my decision as commander in chief based on what I am convinced is our national security interests, I'm also mindful that I'm the president of the world's oldest constitutional democracy. Um, didn't quite say he thought he was legally obligated to do that. In fact, a number of times he said he doesn't think that he's legally required to go to Congress, but it was doing it anyway. The place to look to figure, see whether he has to go to Congress, you know, you would normally start with the text of the Constitution. It's 
uh, it'll be unclear ultimately. Uh, Congress has the power under the Constitution to declare war. We know that's one of Congress's powers. We know that the Constitution makes the president the commander in chief of the armed forces. If that's all you knew, uh, you know, one reasonable conclusion would be that Congress decides whether the US goes to war, and then the president, if we are in war, commands the troops. And there's actually a lot of founding era support when the Constitution was being drafted and ratified that seems to support that idea that there are so many risks for the United States of going into military conflict, Congress should deliberate on that. But if they approve it, uh, then the president is really in charge. And even actually the first three presidents, George Washington, Adams, uh, Jefferson, all at times said, you know what, in order to go to war, I need to go to Congress first. So that would be kind of a concession against interest. But it's not entirely clear from the text what does it mean for Congress to declare war? Um, they, the Congress hasn't declared war since World War II. And the United States has had lots of military conflicts since the 1940s. Uh, and in fact, under international law, there really isn't much of a role for declaring war anymore. It's often illegal to do that. And so uh, hopefully Congress wouldn't go around doing it. And what is a war? Uh, is a bombing campaign in Libya or Syria a war, or is it something else? And if it's not a war for the constitutional purposes, does that mean Congress doesn't have to be involved, and uh, that's a real question. The bigger complication, even beyond the text, what is the war, does it always need to be declared, is that if you looked, uh, just like in international law, you would look to see what nations have done under, say, customary international law, what their customs are, that's actually true in the United States for constitutional law purposes as well. What has, what has the presidents done? What have they done over the years in terms of using force? And you would find that after World War II in particular, many presidents on numerous occasions have ordered military engagements without going to Congress. A very, very large one happened right after World War II. It's called the Korean War. And President Truman did not get congressional authorization to wage a substantial thing we call a war, at least in colloquial terms, the Korean War, uh, without congressional authorization. And then lots of smaller ones since then have been done without congressional authorization, including in 2011, uh, Obama's uh, bombing campaign in Libya through NATO was not, did not receive congressional authorization. He didn't seek it. So what do you do with all that practice that presidents have built up? Now, sometimes presidents have gone to Congress. Uh, Bush did go to Congress, for example, for the Iraq War, as I've mentioned. Bush also got congressional authorization for the so-called War on Terror right after the 9-11 attacks. And so Congress is involved, sometimes in some substantial campaigns, and also Congress authorized the first uh, Iraq uh, war as well uh, that Professor Helfer mentioned back in the early 90s. Well, presidents have claimed, many presidents at least have claimed, that particularly given the practice after World War II, we should not assume that presidents are at least always required to go to Congress, at least for short-term uh, engagements, engagements that do not require an expectation of substantial ground troops. In particular, presidents have claimed that the Constitution does not deem that a war in the sense that it would be required that the president go to Congress. Some presidents have gone further than that and said that they never need to go to Congress. They could start World War III and they don't need to go to Congress. Um, president, uh, both President Bushes at times seemed to imply they had that view, even though they actually they went to Congress anyway, but they seemed to suggest that they were doing it more as a matter of comedy with Congress rather than because the Constitution required it. So the practice makes this particularly unclear um, and presidents have been pretty broad in some of their claims. And Congress, and this is also important, has not often pushed back very much. Um, in Libya, for example, Obama went ahead and bombed uh, for more than 60 days in Libya. And Congress did very little by way of responding to that, um, to, to protest it or try to restrict Obama's actions. Now, not all of the past practice since World War II necessarily would support going into Syria and, and bombing there. And so just to give an example, the Korean War, very big conflict, uh, and also the Libyan uh, conflict that Professor Helfer mentioned from 2011, both were authorized by the UN Security Council of the, uh, uh, the, the US as a party to. That is clearly not going to happen in Syria, as Professor Helfer said. And one of the things Obama emphasized in 2011 was he might not be going to Congress, but at least he had worked through the UN structure that the US was a party to under the treaties, and maybe even suggested that uh, you know, was a key feature of something that made it legitimate. He can't rely on that in the Syria campaign. Now, I'm not sure that should affect the constitutional analysis. Uh, the fact is, the Security Council is not Congress. And if you think 
and I'll, I'll just lay my cards on the table, I actually think the Constitution was designed to f make the President go to Congress except when it, it, defending the United States from attack. So obviously if somebody's attacking or about to attack the United States, it would be kind of crazy to make the President call Congress in a session and have big debates while we're being bombed. And I don't think that the founders intended that. But for more offensive or more optional uses of force, I think the constitutional plan was to have congressional deliberation. If you think that's true, not everybody agrees with what I just said, of course, you don't, shouldn't necessarily think the Security Council is an adequate alternative, since but who's the only U.S. representative on the US Security, UN Security Council? An executive branch representative, diplomat, and nobody from Congress. So it's not obvious that that should necessarily change our analysis. But Obama emphasized in 2011 he couldn't do that now. Another problem for Obama, you know, just rhetorically, uh, nobody likes to um, eat their own words. When he ran for president in 2008, uh, one of his, he was trying to really distinguish himself from Bush and said, Bush has went way too unilateral. And of course, Obama taught constitutional law. He knows this law. He said that the president is constitutionally obligated to go to Congress before going to war, except in self-defense, basically what I just said. That was his view as candidate Obama. Now, he didn't do that in Libya, but he was citing the UN and other things. But I think, I generally think he started to get bothered by the fact that his actions in Syria were about to be quite out of alignment with his own legal views that he had expressed uh, a few years earlier. The, um, one other kind of, I'll just mention, but without going into detail, you can ask about it in the question period. Congress usually hasn't pushed back. Right after Vietnam, Congress did mobilize, got very upset with kind of presidential adventurism and military affairs, passed a framework statute called the War Powers Resolution. It's still on the books. Congress does sign it regularly. And it's, kind of, it's a strange statute. Nobody thinks it's worked all that well. One of the features in it is it says if the president does go into conflict, hostilities, and if that continues for more than 60 days, he has to stop hostilities unless he goes and gets congressional authorization. That's a statute, a binding law. It's enacted over Nixon's veto. Um, there was kind of this mini debate about Libya. The Libya bombing campaign did last more than 60 days. Obama still didn't go to Congress. And apparently his lawyers were very divided over whether he was in fact violating the statute. He finally came out and said, I'm not violating that statute because I'm not engaged in hostilities in Libya. We may bomb, be bombing the heck out of them, but they're not shooting back, so it's not hostilities. Um, <laughs> not everybody thought that was the most persuasive reading of the term hostilities, but that's what it was. In, including the pilots. Uh, and probably including the pilots, which uh, thought, uh, certainly if that was happening in the United States, we were being bombed, we'd probably think there's hostilities occurring. Um, so the big surprise, of course, is that at the last minute, right at the August 30th, 31st, Obama, apparently, after walking around the White House, decided to go to Congress after all, after having said he was about to use force. And a lot of particularly conservative, kind of pro-executive uh, uh, people thought this was a shine of weakness and was really going to be a bad precedent for presidential power. A lot of presidents have always maintained since World War II they don't have to go to Congress, and he had already said he wasn't going to. And I just really think that he, he thought, at least for his legacy and other reasons, that. Uh, this, this was one that needed uh, congressional authorization. One obvious reason for that, and uh, Professor Dumlap mentioned this uh, as well, the American public simply was not on board for getting involved in another Middle Eastern campaign in Syria where it's not obvious that U.S. national security interests are implicated, even though everybody can sympathize with the Syrian people, and no one thinks uh, you know, that those conditions there are uh, good. But it was not, the American people were not being sold on this, and so the president was about to go into a conflict without the public support, without congressional support, and without the international support. And Obama at the last minute decided that's, that's too much and decided, let's see what Congress has to say. Congress wasn't entirely happy to get this issue, I think. By the way, I've talked to members of the Senate staff, and uh, thanks a lot, Obama, for giving this, this one to them. Um, and he was taking a huge risk as president. Because if he then goes to Congress and does not get authorization, what does he do then? Now, he said and sort of hinted, maybe I'd still use force. No, he would not. Okay? He's already in a weak position with the public in Congress and international law before he goes to Congress. If he then has Congress expressly voting him down, he's in an incredibly weak position and almost certainly has to back down at that point, and then probably has weakened his own presidency, maybe not the presidency in general. Now, maybe he would have prevailed. And my guess, just a guess, and only really talking from people I've talked with in the Senate, he probably would have gotten the authorization by the skin of his teeth. He probably would have gotten uh, Congress to authorize it because they didn't want the United States, among other things, to look weak. Um, 
And if he did have authorization, obviously that solves the international or the domestic law problems, not the international uh, law problems. Um, maybe it's all moot now. Uh, these legal uh, questions. Um, we hope that this diplomatic effort that sort of happened almost accidentally through Kerry's remark and the Russians picking it up uh, will in fact achieve progress. And one of the things I think Obama has said, and maybe it's plausible, is it's only the fact that he was really pushing us to the brink of war that got the Syrians to take all this seriously and the Russians to take it seriously. And so in fact, uh, that, he, that his foreign policy isn't as problematic as it might look or as weak as it looked because it maybe forced the Syrians into a, into a <coughs> diplomatic position. Uh, and even the Iranians now are talking about diplomacy. We'll see if that's serious or not. Um, that all, finally, my last word is it all ties back into some things Professor Helfer said, which is we're still, the U.S. is still working in the U.N. Security Council to get a good resolution. And Obama would like one that says something about if they don't cooperate, forces back on the table. Because the idea is that's what's keeping the Syrians and the Russians and the Iranians getting serious about this. But the Rus there's no chance. I think the Russians are going to go along with it. They have the veto power. Uh, they didn't like what happened in Libya. Uh, they don't want to open it. By the way, it's not just Libya. A lot of people uh, you know, were worried about uh, earlier uh, campaigns as well uh, that where the United States um, talked about weapons of mass destruction or other concerns and things got out of hand even without the Security Council like in Iraq. So these international and domestic issues are interestingly uh, connected, but it's possible Obama has established a little bit of a precedent for working with Congress or going to Congress that moves us a little bit back towards that as compared to, say, some of the earlier uh, presidents. Thanks. National Security Law Society, put your email on there. If you don't want emails, that's okay, but we'd like to just have an idea of how many people came, so please put your name on the sheet if you don't mind. Um, and then if anyone has any questions, we can open it up now. Anyone? Okay. <coughs> yeah, we have, we have questions. Um, Professor Helfer, primarily, when you were talking about um, responsibility to protect doctrine, yep. has the debate since August 21st reflected like increasing or decreasing traction for responsibility to protect doctrine? Okay, um, so I think you have to separate out a couple of different components of the doctrine to understand that. And I, I'll just quickly answer it by saying um, it's the procedural component that I think is getting the most pressure. So the basic idea of responsibility to protect is a sort of three-tiered system. Uh, that it's the state itself that has, uh, with respect to the civilians within its borders, that has the uh, primary responsibility to protect them. If it can't, due to lack of capacity, it should request assistance from regional or international bodies. And only if that fails does the rest of the international community's responsibility get engaged. The question then is how it gets engaged, right? And the responsibility to protect doctrine never has been formally endorsed as a doctrine that allows for going outside the Security Council. So if you view the doctrine as having that procedural kind of safeguard in it, that is ultimately at the final analysis, it's the Security Council that has to act, um, then I'd, you could argue that not much has been undermined of that existing principle because there's so many other pieces that um, are still not being challenged. If you think that ultimately, if the Security Council doesn't act, uh, that there are coalitions or individual nations that can move forward, then I do think the principle has been weakened. I think it's kind of reached its apex for the recent times with the, the Libya authorization. And I think um, at the moment, it, procedurally, it's, it's at a lower point. So I think it has been weakened. Could I throw out a, an idea on that? I think that if we listen very carefully what the President was talking about, Yes, he was concerned about protecting uh, Syrian civilians, but he's also talking about preserving the norm against using chemical weapons. And I think that's a little bit different than talking about humanitarian intervention and so forth. And it may be, we ought to keep in mind that weapons of mass destruction, at least nuclear weapons, have always been treated differently in international law. Interesting question here because there's a lot of military people will question the designation of gas 
but chemical weapons as weapons of mass destruction because they're so hard to use to cause truly mass casualties on the scale of a nuclear weapon. So, but assuming that they are, it may be that there is something to think about in terms of a norm and the importance of preserving a norm against a truly horrific weapon of mass destruction like a nuclear weapon or potentially a biological weapon. And we need to understand that, at least in use in Bella, there is the concept of reprisals. In other words, doing something unlawful to stop the other guy from doing something unlawful. And if we look back, you know, norms have to, there's a chicken and egg with norms. They have to start somewhere. We know with the Nuremberg trials, uh, individual culpability for wars of aggression really began with the Nuremberg trials. We can argue about the uh, Versailles Treaty and the Kaiser being held, but really individual, personal, especially down to uh, beyond the head of state culpability. So it may be there's something that we're thinking about, not so much on humanitarian intervention per se, but the idea of generally preserving a norm against horrific science that can truly cause mass casualties. Something to think about. I actually think that the argument is a little bit easier on the international law level than it is on the domestic law level in the absence of congressional support because I think the whole idea of the president defending the United States, it gets a little bit tangential or more than a little bit tangential when, you're, when he's talking about preserving a norm. Does that affect U.S. national security? Of course it does. But from a constitutional analysis, I think there's more of an imminence and directness that was contemplated. Yes, Jeff? So I have a question about the war powers resolution yep. in connection with um, the president's choice to go to Congress. Because I know that most presidents have, have stated either publicly or implicitly that they don't think the war powers resolution is constitutional and that they don't think they're bound by it. However, with President Obama's decision to go to Congress, um, it would seem to say that not only does he believe that he's bound by the War Powers Resolution, but that he thinks that he may not even have the capacity to utilize the War Powers Resolution for a 60-day engagement of hostilities or war. And I just want to know what, sure. like, if, if, if that impression is correct or if you can still reconcile the ability to use the War Powers Resolution with going to Congress to ask for a declaration yep. of war. Good question. So this is, again, this statute enacted in 1973 that has this 60-day cutoff if the president doesn't get authorization. Um, you're right that a number of presidents have at least suggested they think maybe that is unconstitutional anyhow. Obama has not claimed that. And in the Libya debates, specifically just said he thought he was complying with it, although that hostilities argument wasn't a particularly strong one that I mentioned about bombing not hostilities. And he went out, he sort of almost went out of his way not to say it was unconstitutional, which is an interesting move of itself. You're absolutely right. Some presidents have claimed that even if it's constitutional, by saying cut off in 60 days, it somehow has authorized shorter uses of force, 50 days. You know, that's a de very debatable proposition, because if you read the resolution, it begins by saying the president may not use force unless authorized or defending the United States. But if he does, must stop after 60 days. It's not clear that's really an authorization. Some presidents have claimed it. And you're absolutely right. He's not, he does not expressly claim that the resolution's already giving him authority. So that might be another way in which Obama has kind of pulled back from some of the other presidential claims. Nice point. OK, we have time for maybe one more question. Does anyone have? Yeah, Jim. It was mentioned that one reason why Russia might be reluctant to join a Security Council resolution is basically the aftermath of Libya and the tipping of the scales. How uh, feasible is it to ever have a military strike where y the scope is so narrow that it actually doesn't tip the scales? I'm not sure, Danny, if you can, when you say tip the scales, you mean? Uh, as far as whether the, um, what one side fighting, it gains those. Oh, I see, I see, I understand. Mm -hmm. Right, no, that's, that's a very good question, right? So in, in that sense, Libya was an interesting sort of experiment in trying rather than having, uh, you know, the U.S. Is often talks about the surgical nature of its strike, or uh, that the Security Council was trying to say, look, only for this purpose, only for protecting civilians in a no-fly zone. But 
Of course, right? If you're, you know, if you think about just going back a couple of degrees from, well, I have to protect civilians, so the civilians happen to be in the rebel area. So if I protect the civilians, I'm also going to necessarily be, in some way, empowering um, the the rebels. Now, I mean, the allegations were, and I have to go back and look at the historical record, but the allegations were that some of the the strikes were mut were ten tenuously related to mm -hmm. um, yes. protecting civilians. So I think the Russians actually have a point. I mean, what was authorized uh, w was not much of a constraint on NATO's intervention. And I would just add that you know, Obama, many of the Obama administration's statements at that time suggested that their goal was ultimately regime change. And if you're saying that and making that your foreign policy, it, in fact, it's hard to imagine they would stop with just kind of keeping the planes or something out of the air when they're, it would not be viewed as successful as a foreign policy. So, when your expressed goal, and I think it was pretty close to being expressed, was to get Qaddafi out of power, it's not doesn't take a lot of paranoia to think on the Russians' part to think that was part of what we were hoping to achieve there, um, and may well be what we would be trying to. Some people might think with Assad getting out of power as well. It's I don't again I don't think that would be that shocking to us to think no. that uh, the Obama administration would like to see some change there. And, and from a military perspective, just to do exactly what it. The Security Council resolution said, if you're going to use planes, you're going to take down the entire air defense system of Libya, which kills a lot of people. And then from a military perspective, if they have intelligence that shows that these guys are only staying in the field because of Gaddafi's personal leadership and they're threatening, then you can make a military argument that right. cut off the head. I mean, it's, you know, going after, com quote, command and control is a traditional military means. And if it also fits with these other agendas, then that can be very persuasive inside the administration. And the Russians, of course, are concerned because they don't want to set, and the Chinese too, especially with Tibet and all this, set some kind of president where uh, regime change is even within the gloss of history as applied to, quote, humanitarian interventions. Okay. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.